much again, and please, another round of applause for His Highness and His Excellencies for joining us today. Well, thank you all for being here. I'm really excited to bring you this next conversation. Joining me on stage is Nick Dreckman. He is, of course, the Julius Baer Interim CEO. We're going to talk a little bit today about the future of wealth management and private banking, not only around the world, but specifically here in the region. So I'm so thrilled that you're here. And Nick, welcome. It's great to have you. Thank you very much, Dan. So let's begin by talking about some of just the recent news flow around the bank. I think it's important that we start at a high level here. Uh, recent events at Julius Baer, including the Cigna loan write-off, the departure of the CEO, I guess you could say have cast somewhat of a shadow around the firm, for want of a better word, and also the traditional Swiss banking model. So as you navigate through this most recent challenge, what is your message to the market and some of the key lessons learned here? Well, I think at the end, um, yes, uh, these recent events have been unfortunate, um, but I think we dealt very decisively uh, with all of them, um, and we took a lot of measures. Uh, keep in mind also, uh, we are still um, a, a profitable company. We almost uh, uh, printed uh, half a billion of Swiss franc net profit besides of this, uh, this write-down that we had to do. But I think in that sense, you know, our strategy uh, in terms of focusing on servicing private individuals and high net worth and ultra high net worth clients around the globe is absolutely sound. Um, and in that sense, you know, I'm very confident that, you know, we, draw, uh, we drew a, a, a strong line under all these events, and now it's a matter of moving forward. And as you move forward, particularly looking at targeting new clients in this region, can you say to this room that you have adequate risk management structures in place? Yes, absolutely. Okay, so the dust is still settling on... Um, I guess the, the, the industry broadly in Switzerland as well, particularly after the CS, UBS tie up. Just talk to me quickly about what you're seeing macro uh, economically right now within the industry. Um, what is the market opportunity for you right now, particularly in the region, as we look at the disruption that we've seen within your sector? Well, I think uh, macro view in, in that sense, um, you know, in our segment, in our client segment, uh, the market is still growing, uh, depending on which survey or which consultant you look at. But uh, there is still significant growth when it comes to uh, net, high net worth and ultra high net worth uh, individuals and growth uh, in that sense. Um, this year, and here I echo a bit uh, what has been said before, I think is a very interesting year. Um, with a lot of ups and downs, interest rates remain higher, as we know, um, but that usually creates opportunities for institutes like Julius Fair, um, because that's where um, these kind of clients seek advice. That's where our value proposition actually comes uh, in into play. We believe we will end this year higher uh, than where we started, but there will be several bumps. There are plenty of elections. It was also been mentioned. Uh, around the globe, the US being one of them as well, a very important one. Um, so I believe there will be many uh, opportunities uh, to take um, profit or to take uh, uh, some, uh, some, some good opportunities, uh, but you need to stay vigilant and, and you really need to, uh, to be close to the market and to the clients. So how do you do that in this part of the world? Well, it, this part of the world for us is uh, indeed very important. Um, you know, Julius Fair has been in the DIFC as the first bank. So we have license plate number one. We're really proud of, of that. Uh, so we'll celebrate 20 years uh, in Dubai, and Dubai being the hub for the whole uh, region here. Um, and in that sense, you know, we'll continue to invest. Uh, uh, just recently, uh, equally here, uh, we have been granted uh, a digital asset custody license uh, in the DIFC, so we can start also uh, looking into these kind of spaces because these are areas where definitely we, th we see demand, where clients are asking for advice and how to deal with these kind of things. And what's the feedback that you're getting from uh, clients old and new in Dubai and around the UAE? In terms of markets or in yeah. terms of... Well, markets are uh, um, tricky, uh, I would say, and therefore, as I said, I think the advice is very warmly welcome, so people seek advice, uh, and we're happy to provide that. I think in general here, uh, the mood is very good. Um, uh, the situation uh, geopolitically, obviously, uh, is tricky, um, but at the end here, there is a tremendous amount of growth, uh, there is a tremendous uh, amount of innovation, there is a tremendous amount of business building happening across the region, 
Um, and that's obviously something which is always good for our business. So let's talk a little bit about the fintech opportunity as well and what you're doing in the digital wealth management space here. Fintech firms rapidly entering the wealth management space. They're offering lower fees and, and leveraging technology. So how do you compete and compare? <laughs> Well, it's interesting because I, I've, I've been sitting on these kind of stages uh, already for quite a while. And I remember five or six years ago, you know, sitting here with some fintechs, some robo-advisors that told me, you know, your bank will go out of business uh, in the next two or three years. And that has not happened in the, in the meantime, right? Having said that, um, I think this whole fintech ecosystem is extremely important for a bank like Julius Fair. Technology in general is absolutely uh, essential for our business in order to bring our value proposition appropriately uh, and in a most efficient way uh, to our clients, right? Uh, so in that sense, um, a, a sound and good fintech um, ecosystem helps us to stay on our toes to begin with. Uh, but also allows us to partner, to see, to experiment. And not everything needs to be invented by ourselves. Uh, we're more than happy uh, to work with accelerators, with fintech companies, with consultants, and so on and so forth. As, for example, we're doing here in the DIFC as well. There is an innovation uh, uh, work that we're doing around digital asset inheritance, uh, which is something uh, where obviously we see uh, potential. Okay, so, and what is the broader potential within the space? Where do you think you can have a competitive advantage? Look, at, at the end, I think, you know, we always need to look for, for Julius Fair, we need to look at what is our value proposition. Our value proposition is that we want to advise our clients when it comes to their wealth, to maintain it, to grow it, or to pass it on. So everything that we do, every investment in technology or in people or in processes that we do should service that kind of purpose. And in that sense, you know, topics like data, topics like digital or um, uh, distributed ledger technology, topics like cybersecurity, cloud, um, artificial intelligence are absolutely key for us. And therefore, you know, to partner and to, um, to innovate there in these kind of areas is essential for, for Julius Fair. How are you leveraging AI today? Sci-fi fantasy or ultimate end goal reality for Julius Fair? Look, I think, uh, allow me to say the following. Uh, I read a, a, a study, I think it was from IMD in, in Switzerland, that already today, 75% of all our employees are using ChatGTP or AI. We just don't know it, right? And actually, as a CEO uh, of, of Julius Baer, to a certain extent, that concerns me. Um, because there is uh, data security around it, there are topics around it like model risks, hallucination, and all these kind of things, which obviously we need to address. Having said that, I think absolutely for us, uh, generative AI is a topic that we need to take care of and that we're looking into as we speak. The way I'm looking at it right now is that, to begin with, we're in a stage where, for Julius Fair at least, we're more talking about efficiency gains um, and, and um, cost savings, if you want, more efficient way of processing things. Give you uh, two or three very concrete examples. What we're experimenting with are summarizing topics. So I'll give you a text, I'll give you voice, and I want to get in two, three, five bullets a summary of a conversation, of a document, maybe even translating that in different languages. At the other hand, uh, we're looking, for example, uh, for example, at our publicly available research material. And we're feeding our entirely uh, research material to an engine, and then basically have client requests and have investment advisors that use that in order to support the advice giving to our clients. Now, important for us is that there is always, for the time being, still a human being in between to basically make sure to understand what comes out. Is it sensible? Does it make sense? Is it potentially hallucinating or not? Also to understand where has the algorithm basically picked up that piece of advice? What is the source? And these are all things that we're looking at as we speak. But again, I think we're in a very early stage. As I said, I think we're more talking these days about efficiency gains rather than innovation, new products, new business models, and, and stuff like that. That might come in a second stage. When you talk about efficiency gains, do you mean perhaps reducing the human headcount here and replacing those human wealth advisors with artificial intelligence? Is that something that you're looking at in the future? 
So that's an interesting question, and uh, as I sit here and have been in, in technology for, for many, many years, um, we at Julius Fair believe when it comes to uh, servicing individuals, wealthy individuals, the human, in, the human interaction will remain to be essential. But what is important, I think, is that obviously that advice that we're giving uh, to our clients is based on um, most efficient tools, uh, um, all the information that is available, all the rules and regulations, be that tax rules, be that knowledge and experience rules, be that um, all uh, suitability uh, things, you know, that they are obviously properly adhered to. A human being today is almost not in a position to do that as markets move faster and faster. But the way it's been delivered can be either hybrid, or we call it hybrid, either through purely technology or through a, through a human interaction. Also a real question here about whether or not your most high net worth clients around the world are going to be able to trust your advice if it is being driven by digitization and artificial technology into the future. So how do you bring the client with you on this journey? Look, at the end, uh, uh, this is what, uh, in, in, that's the business we're in. Uh, we're here for, for 135 years, and you need to build that trust that the advice that we're giving to our clients is based on sound foundation, uh, makes a lot of sense, and there is a track record that we're doing the right things. Now, whether you do that uh, just out of your stomach, uh, or whether you do that on the basis of sound models, sound technology, uh, digital means, I think that's at the end where, where the future will go. Um, talk to me about your future client as well, because to stay relevant, you need to attract the next generation of investors. What strategies can you put in place to not just capture the attention, but also the assets of millennials and Gen Z? Look, I think our clients have been changing over decades and over years, and they will continue to change. And Julius Baer has to continue to be part of, of that change uh, in terms of, uh, of our clients. What we see these days is obviously that information, you know, in the past, uh, the bankers usually had an information advantage. That's gone. Usually our clients are equally or sometimes even better informed than we are. But the question is what you make out of this. What is it that you want to bet on? What is your conviction? And then how to play that best? And in that sense, you know, uh, we obviously see younger generations being more interested in sustainable investing, uh, in looking at topics of the future, um, in obviously interacting with their banker in a different way, more digital, more real-time, more anytime, anywhere. Um, and these are things, obviously, that we need to um, walk along with them. But at the end, the essence of what we're offering to help them to navigate financial markets for their individual wealth still remains the same. What about the opportunities that millennial and, and uh, Gen Z clients are potentially targeting? I know you've spoken about this before. It's often a, a topic at the FinTech Festival, and it's cryptocurrencies. Um, how is Julius Baer thinking about the market right now, and how is this being allocated into client portfolios? So cryptocurrencies to us is just one first step. Um, if you ask me strategically, for me, the topic of distributed ledger technology and maybe in future digital assets is much more important. Remember, we're a wealth manager. We advise on your wealth. And some of the uh, advice that, or some of your assets are liquid and are on, on stock exchange, as we heard before. But there are still assets which today there is no market for, there is no liquidity for. And I think that's where cryptocurrencies is just the first step to digitize other assets will be much more uh, an interesting game changer for us as Julius Baer, because at the end, that's where we want to advise on once these markets start to emerge, once we can sell a fraction and there is liquidity on an ongoing basis. So for me, uh, distributed ledger technology is less so about cryptocurrencies. Yes, we can, our clients can actually uh, trade cryptocurrencies also with Julius Baer. Um, but, you know, the, the, the allocation that our clients have is tiny. Um, let's remember also we've gone through a crypto winter uh, just very recently. Um, and therefore, you know, it's not a big revenue booster for, for Julius Baer. But I think the underlying um, principles, the underlying ideas are essential for us to move forward.
So you, you uh, can manage client risk and demand around cryptocurrencies moving forward? Yes. Okay. Yes. That's, I think that's really interesting as well. And then I also wanted to ask you, just internally, going back to your focus now as you grow the business in the region and navigate some of the challenges we were talking about before, internally at Julius Bear, are there also legacy systems at the firm that make uh, your tech team perhaps want to pull their hair out? How do you stay current internally to serve the needs of clients and to make sure that the technology within the business is match fit for what you're trying to achieve? Look, at the end, this is a, a matter of how do you enable as a, as a corporate innovation. Um, and I think it starts, obviously, um, with the people and the culture that you have. Um, at the end, you know, it's a matter of top-down and bottom-up kind of that needs, to, that needs to come together. Top-down in a sense that you need to provide space, you need to provide resources, you need to give a bit of guidance in which, which are the topics that are relevant and important for you. But then even more importantly is that from a, from a grassroots point of view, that people try to experiment, that people are engaging also with some fintech accelerators, with some fintech companies, and try to learn also with consultants and the likes. At the end, the tricky part, uh, the way we are looking at it is, once you have a good idea, how do you bring it to life within the corporate? How do you scale this, really? And there, obviously, we see is not a one-to-one -one transmission from innovation, a product, and then straight into production and making, making a, a lot of revenues in that sense. Sometimes uh, this disappears for one, two years, and suddenly some things that we have been innovating on a year or two ago appears in one or the other application that we're rolling out to clients at a later stage. OK, so let's shift focus back over to what we were talking about before, which is how you're navigating some of these challenges. We skimmed over this earlier, but I want to take a little bit more of a deep dive. As you continue to evolve globally and in the region, the business still doesn't have an appointed CEO. When can we expect that to take place? When are we going to get an announcement? Well, you're talking to the wrong person. <laughs> <laughs> um, but is there a timeline? No. Not yet. I think uh, we take the time that, uh, that it takes. OK. Um, we also spoke before about the impact of the CS-UBS merger. This was a huge shockwave um, around the world, and in particular in the region as well. Has Julius Baer been able to capitalize on that? Well, I think there was definitely uh, an uncertainty and a, and a certain shakeup, um, which led to opportunities. But um, I think, you know, um, our strategy uh, in terms of hiring bankers, in terms of uh, bringing new assets in, uh, trying to attract clients, has not changed in that sense. And every now and then, some of our competitors are in a disarray that we're trying to capitalize on. But this is not uh, something very particular or that we would have put a, a tremendous amount of focus on this particular situation. I think if you're looking at our, uh, our, our hiring efforts, um, they have uh, basically been confirmed. Um, and if you look at the distribution of where we're hiring from, that also has not materially changed. And then internally, as you navigate this challenge, what's your message to the, mar to the market as uh, this cleanup continues to take effect, as we await uh, the new CEO being appointed, and you also perhaps look at your internal risk systems in, in the wake of this huge write-down? Look, I think at the end, uh, what's, what's our or what's my key learning is, um, you know, trust uh, and reputation is key. And it's built over many, many years, over 135 years, and we need to cherish that also moving forward. At the end, being close to clients, um, uh, advising them in the best interest for them, builds this kind of trust. And the more we are um, 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 you know, investing and making sure that these kind of things uh, are at center stage for, for us, uh, the better it is. Final question, are we going to be seeing a little bit more of you in the region? Yes, of course. I have come to the region already before, and I will continue to be here. Um, as said, you know, we're, we're in uh, very exciting endeavors with the DIFC around innovation, um, and I'm looking forward to continue this. All right. Well, Nick, I really appreciate the conversation today. Thank you so much for joining us on stage. Ladies and gentlemen, please again make him feel welcome. It is Nick Dreckman, Julius Baer's interim CEO.